The subject that I'm going to speak to is um, something that th I think all of us have a hard time with. Uh, and so what I'm going to address, I'm going to address within the context of an anecdote. Um, the subject is a life larger than one's own. As an idea worth spreading, there aren't very many that are more significant. Whatever stage of um, career you're at, anywhere you are in the world, um, if you feel a sense that you're just not doing enough for people, just remind yourself you do the best you can. Um, you do what you can, you know, when you can. Because if you put too much pressure on yourself, um, you can sometimes be self-defeating in that process. I am not a sociologist and I am not a psychologist. This subject is one which really um, is deserving more of someone who has a background and a profession in these areas. What I do is forecast and value feature films, television shows, uh, television networks, music, music companies, and a variety of these other things. Um, I've been doing this since 1988. Um, in 1988, I was asked by the world's banks to develop ways to do these things so the banking community could lend money against the value of intellectual property. Since then, I've done this about 4,000 times um, for about $200 billion worth of transactions that I've worked on. Really what this talk references is a company that is named Good Films. The company is not, is not my idea. Um, it's the idea of a gentleman named Scott Budnick. Scott Budnick, by background, was referred to me by a client of mine named Thomas Tull. The idea of good films is really aiming to finance film and television shows that are uh, supportive of some type of a social impact cause. Uh, the funding is most likely going to come from endowments, foundations, um, very wealthy individuals as philanthropists, some investors. It's going to operate out of Los Angeles, but will most likely function pretty much all around the world. Just by background, like many people, I came from a family divided. Uh, parents divorced, um, grew up with a couple of brothers, thankful to have a strong uh, mom who kept me out of trouble. I grew up not far from here in Sepulveda. Uh, the street is not one that you'd want to visit between Roscoe and Parthenia at late hours. I have a lot to be thankful for, like, again, many People in this university where I came out of, you come through a school like this and you dream of a bright future. How can you not? Um, like many people here, you're super energetic, you're driven, and you want to accomplish things as best you can. Uh, I entered into the business world very well educated, uh, came out of the finance program at Cal State Northridge, uh, but to be truthful, didn't feel as though I really understood business at all. I understood finance, marketing, accounting, you know, management out of a book, but I grew up, again like many, not from a family where the business was done. Uh, I was frankly just lucky to not get shot, given where I lived. Um, and so, in doing so, as I started to you know, progress, and I found myself able to, and fortunate to, uh, move along, I found that in order to do so, at least as I saw it, I, I had to kind of conform. Um, I came out of a past where I didn't have any need to conform. I like again, lots of students on this campus wore flip flops, shorts, t shirts, and speedos was pretty much my whole wardrobe. Um, I didn't have money for anything else. So now I'm wearing a suit. I, I had to learn how to tie a tie out of a book called Dress for Success, um, which probably is still out. I didn't know how to tie one until then. Um, didn't still didn't have any socks and still don't. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what happens when you go through life like this is you start out and you're so energized and in the middle of your, your development of your career you can go numb to things and it sucks um, but sometimes it's necessary. You, when you're naive about things are vulnerable and in overcoming the vulnerability to adjust to business you lose a little of yourself. And what was enthusiasm and excitement all the time gets numbed down. Because in the absence of doing such a thing, you can get your head beat in, in business. Um, and, and, that's just, and frankly, that's what happened to me. Um, as time went by, I was uh, put in a situation where I was able to be asked by the banks in the world 
to develop these techniques for forecasting film. I came out of, out of Wells Fargo Bank where I was an entertainment lender, spent seven and a half years doing this, um, and left to join a valuation firm named Houlihan Loki, Howard and Zukin, Kit Loki, honestly one of the greatest people I think I've ever known. Um, just a, a, a great leader manager, was a great mentor from my perspective. He encouraged me to do this. When the banks called and they said, now that you're at a valuation firm that values businesses, can you value intellectual property in 1988 in such a way where we can lend money against it? Because it's never been done that way before. And so for me, it was transformational. Um, I developed these techniques. I invited people from outside the company, mostly from the statistical world, a gentleman named Louis Weil, who was a professor at, Cal, at uh, Caltech. He studied under a gentleman named Milton Friedman, who's pretty renowned in finance. And he kind of watched over whether I was being stupid um, or not being stupid, and was very helpful to me. Um, again, during this period of time, I traveled. For 15 years, I was at Houlihan Loki, and I traveled all around the world. I worked on, while I was there, a couple thousand transactions. Um, nothing like this had ever been done before. Uh, and, um, you know, there were billions and billions and billions of dollars involved in all of these things, but everything that I did was for helping somebody make money, which is fine. Uh, candidly, it's a privilege. You find yourself graduating from a university, you're fortunate to get a good job, you're even more fortunate to get into a role that you feel is interesting, beyond that becomes inspiring. Uh, you're inspired by the people that you interact with. You help them build their businesses, develop ideas and things that they do, and see them really blossom into great companies that are worth massive amounts of money that employ all kinds of people. But um, you sacrifice a lot because, in my case, all I did was travel. All I did was work. I did so to support family, but in so doing, you have to leave family a lot to do this sort of thing. Um, it also leaves little time to uh, feel as though you're living a life larger than your own. What you're doing is you're just getting through it. Um, in time, what happened was I started to really become very, very hungry to want to do what people did for me when I was a kid. How can I help people who can't really help themselves? I'm doing so indirectly through the jobs that are being created by the companies that I'm helping arrange financing for, but I'm disconnected from it. And I didn't have a feeling that I was like that I had my hands in it. I started teaching and coaching, um, you know, I, I, as was commented upon at UCLA, here at Northridge. I created with Professor Shelton here a uh, field study class, which was very rewarding. Then work got busy again, and I got sucked into it. I, I, you give money away in charities, um, but you're still distanced from it. And then along comes this, you know, this referral from Mr. Tull named Scott Budnick. Scott Budnick uh, worked with a guy who created a company that produced 14 films over a 12-year period. Three of them were named Hangover. Um, they, did, they did reasonably well. Um, he did a number of other feature films. And here's this guy, Budnick, who for 14 years, he's, he's building his career. He's doing these great things, making these spectacularly successful films. And early on in that period of time, I'm not sure how many people knew this, he was invited to go to a juvenile uh, detention facility here in California on a weekend, and most likely talking about um, job creation for kids who have grown up in even more difficult circumstances than my own, where recidivism, which is the really the phenomena of finding yourself going back and forth and back and forth in prison because you were never given any support, never given any guidance, um, it's a horrible thing. Um, and so Scott just got sucked into this, and he kept going back to, the, to these juvenile facilities week after week after week, offering teaching and advice. Eventually became so en engrossed in it that he created um, a foundation, an endowment, um, called the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, which exists today. And in doing so, raises a huge amount of money and helps establish educational facilities at prisons and um, passes bills in state legislature. He's very involved with the president and Brothers Keeper. He's just, he's for real. He's at the top of his game after Hangover 3. 
if he can get a job anywhere in the industry, studio executive, and he quits to run Anti-Recidivism Coalition full-time. He shows up at my door about a year after he does that at the referral of Thomas, and the question is asked of me, is it possible that we could create a film, television, production finance company and raise $300 million? Is it possible we could do that? Um, in which case, I, can, I, Scott, can support the creation of films that tell the stories of overcoming adversity. And I could do it with the foundations, and I could do it with the endowments. Um, I could do it and time it to where you know, certain state bills that we're trying to pass to get more things put in place that can help avoid some of the problems that so many people are confronted by can somehow be passed. So a film comes out at the same time as a, as a social impact cause for a foundation at the same time as a, as a legislative agenda. And it's a crescendo all at the same time. Hundreds of millions of people see it perhaps throughout the world and maybe it does some good. Um, and I actually wasn't prepared for it. As I'd said, I was in a state of numbness because you can't help but be so. But as time went by, he invited me uh, to a place I've tried to avoid my whole life, Men's County Jail. Um, <laughs> he had a, uh, when I, where I grew up, I'm not kidding. Um, he, they have on the fifth floor, it's a five floor facility, which I never knew. On the fifth floor, they have an education center there. It uh, supposedly supports as many as a thousand of the as upwards of 5,000 inmates that um, are at any time there. And it teaches people how to get a job and different kinds of jobs to have. I didn't know any of this. So I was invited as a contingent of other entertainment media uh, professionals from different talent agencies and, and production companies and so forth. And I was in a room a little bigger than the one I'm standing in now. And the question asked of all of us by Scott, who was flanked by people from the White House and people from a various um, you know, endowments that, that I, can, I can't name them all right now. Um, the question was, how can we, the entertainment industry, work together to try to help people that are coming through uh, an organization like this, an institution like this, get jobs perhaps behind camera, keep good jobs? And in so doing, he said, and I'm going to embark on an initiative, I'm letting everybody know this now, of raising $300 million, and he points at me and he says, and that guy's gonna help me do it. I had no prepared notes, even less so than this TED talk, um, <laughs> and hadn't, I didn't know what to say. So I said, let me give it a shot. Um, so good films will, in, will intend to promote essentially each of these uh, areas of mission. These missions that you can see up behind me on these screens correspond, for the most part, to the missions of endowments, foundations, and philanthropies uh, all over the world. And um, there's, a, there's a corresponding list that is just too long to get into of recent and past films uh, that, you know, like The Blind Side and films like that, that do this sort of stuff, but they sort of do it haphazardly. Good Films is going to do this and just focus on this. And so in many ways, Good Films is, is symbolic. It's, to me, it's an anecdote of um, causing or enabling somebody to live a life larger than their own. Um, I, I continue to provide advisory services uh, through FTI Consulting, um, who was kind enough to um, grant me to make some changes in my life, which I had to do, because once I said to Scott, I'm in, um, I mean, I work, you know, I work about 14, 15 hours a day uh, for clients, I had to scale it back because you can't completely commit uh, to help something like raising $300 million and the only way it's going to happen is if I was there. Uh, you can't do it if it's part time and so uh, thankfully um, FTI Consulting who is my employer um, recognizing what I was doing felt the same way I did and said go for it and so I have. Uh, I've modified my employment relationship um, which was not inexpensive um, and that's a choice because you can continue to make all this money and use it for charity, which I could do, or give it all up, which I did, in exchange for something much more modest, and you know, and commit myself to a process of raising money for nothing. Um, I've taken no money for doing now well over a year's worth of work, which is totally fine. Uh, you go through a period of personal discovery when you do this sort of thing. It's um, 
it's therapeutic in many ways. It's hard to describe. If you've spent 30 plus years every day banging away at trying to do the things I've been describing, and you don't think that transforming is something that doesn't come from uh, an experience like this, you gotta think about it a little bit harder. For me, the personal discovery was this. It's like a curtain was up. I never realized how many wealthy people, almost everyone that I've now met, like the top 100 wealthiest families in the United States, every single one of them has a philanthropy. And they're huge. They've spent their entire lives as wealthy people building wealth. And where I, like many people, probably assume that they are greedy, I have found that what they're, for the most part, doing is giving back. And um, for me, as I've gone meeting and meeting and meeting and I've met them all, I am, I am beyond motivated. It's hard to put in words. Um, it's like you discover humanity again. You think that these people who I've been helping make money all this time, and that's all they wanted to do in life is make money, what they're doing with the money, certainly they, they live well, but what they're doing with a lot of it is they're giving a lot of it back in a lot of different ways. And it's just incredibly encouraging, and I didn't expect to see that more than I had, I had ever expected, N much less numbness, um, much greater connectivity, that numbness that you need to go through, I felt I needed to go through, is dissipating. It's still there because I still do a lot of work for a lot of other people, but it, it's getting better. So from the standpoint of a, a TED conversation, an idea worth sharing, a life larger than your own, it is to be alive. You can't deny it. But at the same time, I'll go back to my comments at the beginning. Don't beat yourself up. If I had tried to do something like this as I was starting out, no way. I wouldn't have had the ability. I didn't know what to do. It took me 25, 30 years to have the capability, to have the reputation, the credibility around the world that, that I'm fortunate to have uh, to be able to do this. Um, and frankly, have saved a little bit of money to be able to take the time to do this. You do it in your own time. You do it in your own way. But I feel that this was an idea worth sharing, and thank you.